Hi, everybody. I am Michelle Tennant, the Henderson County Beekeepers Association president in 2023 and 2024. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Tom. Now, I've been saying Repass, but how do you say your last name? Repass. That's so it's pretty, yeah, you're pretty close. Repass. Well, yep. someone also said uh, Repass. Like it was like all different types of. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a French name. So, uh, you know, rep I've been told so many times. Rapa, it means meal in French. I'm like, I know, but it's not of French uh, origin, but <laughs> so, it's probably the it. only French word I know, actually. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm I'm Bavarian. My mom's Bavarian and I have a French first name. So my entire yeah. side of that family is like yeah, my mom is from Bavaria too. She was born in Nuremberg. Perfect. So Stuttgart yeah. and uh, right outside of Munich. And so anyway. Well, yeah, I've been there. But yeah, okay. Perfect. Sprech Let's see Deutsch. Yeah. Sprech see Deutsch? No, no, ein bisschen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, ich auch. Yeah. So anyway, everybody, everybody's like, "Will you just get on with it?" So we're gonna get on with it, everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to you. Uh, our treasurer, Mike, um, the owner of Carolina Bee Farm, is so excited. He's the one that is uh, the reason why you're coming to teach us about queens and mead making, and we're gonna get into a little preview of what you're gonna teach. I have all. I have a previous obligation for work. And have had that because I was kind of bummed it was on a Saturday um, because I actually have another obligation. So I won't be there, but I'm hoping that the team will actually record it so that I can see it. Are you okay with us recording it too for of everybody? Course. Of course. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, I, great. I presented all over at all types of venues. So it's all about educating. Perfect. You know, and a, a really good friend of mine, um, he's probably one of the top mean, mean makers in the world, I would, I would consider him. But he said, knowledge is something you can give away and still retain. You know, it's all about teaching. When I started out, you know, what is it, 42 years now, I think, when I started, you know, there were books, and, you know, the bees don't read the bee books, of course, and then, you know, my dad, and, and there were others, but a lot of it was really trial and error, and a lot of error, and so at least now we can share our knowledge and experience, and you'll know, help others, like, avoid some of the mistakes that, you know, I made over the years, and sometimes I still make, even though I should know better. Well, I have a lot of beekeepers who are telling me that they can't attend uh, directly, but they want to have the recording for later. I did donate my Zoom room to the team that will be present. So you guys can log in, uh, given the, and I'll, I'll text you the information too, so that you have it, um, but, you know, so that that can be retained for the beekeepers who aren't present on Friday and Saturday. But let's get into a little bit about what you're going to teach us. So, um, you know, I've been talking a little bit about the basics of uh, queen rearing and then also mead making but from your own words tell us a little bit you know what's your claim to fame and beekeeping as I understand it uh, you're a pretty big deal <laughs> and then also like what can we expect next weekend you know so when I started out I, I would you know as a new beekeeper in the 80s and and uh, when you needed new queens you know to requeen you'd buy them and they'd ship them in and you know you pinch the old queen put the new queen in but sometimes the new queens were not better than the older queens that I had, you know, gotten rid of. Um, you know, I was requeening on schedule. You know, you need to requeen every year, um, or so we were told, and that didn't seem quite right. You know, perfect. Some perfectly good queens were being, uh, you know, gotten rid of. And I realized I have friends who are commercial beekeepers, and you kind of have to like you requeen the whole whole yard. You know, you can't just go this one yes, this one no. I get that, but when you're a sideliner or a hobby beekeeper, you know, maybe you can keep them around longer. And then I had this one experience um, where I, I bought a queen and I put her in the hive and she was a drone layer right from the start. So I contacted the, the producer and he was just kind of like, first he was questioning me, uh, did I even know what that was? And then it's like, well, that's your problem. And of course that made me kind of angry and he's no sure. longer in business uh, for good reason. Um, but that's when I just started raising my own and, and I just did it for myself. I had no interest in selling it or selling queens or anything like that i just enjoyed doing it and the one thing i discovered is you can really select for the kind of queens that you like you know if you're buying from someone else you know you can read what their website says and you can talk to them but you don't know exactly what what their breeding program is i mean there's some queen producers that are very open about it so that's wonderful but you know if, if you like bees of a certain type you know certain characteristics you can select for your own and so i was doing that so i'd never had to buy queens again and word got out and word got around. And so I kind of had, um, you know, the opportunity to sell to other beekeepers to a point where it's really become 
the main focus of my sideline beekeeping business. Uh, I love raising queens. You know, when I when I have queens that I'm catching, I'm like, oh wow, this is such a good one. Look at her brood pattern. I wish I could keep her for myself. But you know, you've got a couple of hundred queens to sell. You can't keep them all. I mean, unless you you know you have a lot of more colonies than I would know what to do with. Um, but that's kind of the goal is to raise really good, qu high quality queens um, for what you want. And it's one of the most, I love raising queens, you know, probably making mead, drinking mead, um, raising queens, you know, maybe catching swarms. Those are the most fun parts of, of beekeeping that I, I think of. And so it just became sort of a, a small sideline business for me that really expanded over the years. I don't ship. I don't, I don't even advertise. It's completely word of mouth. Um, and if you're looking at it to make a little money from bee, I mean, I do it anyway because I love it. But if you're looking to make a little money from beekeeping, you know, $500 worth of queens, I can pick up with one hand, but $500 worth of honey, I mean, I'm, that's heavy, you know. So uh, it's something that I've really gone around teaching other beekeepers to do uh, so that they can, even if they only want to raise 10 queens a year just for themselves, you know, it's such a wonderful part of beekeeping. It's a, a, a skill that really has kind of gone away as a lot of us got so used to just ordering in bees from elsewhere. Um, and then, you know, with the Africanized bees coming in, in some of the queen breeding areas, you know, I, I've, I've witnessed even around here, beekeepers who had some really defensive bees. And, you know, we never sent them to be tested for, you know, Africanization, but I mean, they were those, I mean, there's always been hot colonies of bees, but these were more defensive than, I mean, you, they'd follow you a mile if you walked away from the bee yard. I mean, that's not yeah. normal. You know, that's just not normal. And even if they weren't like, you know, 100% Africanized, they just had a small percentage that was still more than, um, you know, more than should be. And, and some folks keep their bees in their backyard. I mean, it's dangerous, you know, if kids are around and pets. So. So are you going to be going over some basics that will help people really mitigate the risk like that, you know, um, on like how to have more gentle colonies and whatnot? Is that something that we can expect? Um, I, I'll mention it. I'm not going to, because I, I spent... I have a whole series of uh, bee breeding presentations that I can give, like it's an all day presentation. And that includes some of the ones that I'm gonna talk about, uh, but that's like a whole nother conversation about, you know, not just raising queens, but breeding bees, which is challenging because, you know, most of us open made our queens and we don't have a control of the, the DCAs, the drone congregation areas. Uh, so there's ways to mitigate that, you know, putting up drone holding colonies. My puppy is trying to come up here right now. Oh, well, perfect. We would love to welcome your puppy. Okay. So let me, let me just see here. So uh, it looks like on, you want on to Friday uh, at 6 p.m. at the city of Hendersonville Operations Center. Oh, hi, buddy. Yeah. Is Jack? Is that, his name is Jack. He's a little red healer. Oh, hi, Jack. <laughs> hi, sweetheart. So on Friday, you're going to be do, doing genetic diversity in honeybees and why it's important for beekeepers. I think that that's important. And then on Saturday morning, starting at nine, so we're going to do queen bee basics. Then at one after lunch, sustainable beekeeping, the key components. And then at 3.30, we're going to do basics of mead making. Correct. What do you mean by sustainable beekeeping? What does that mean? That is a great question. And honestly, you know, and I, I'm totally upfront with this when I start that presentation, you know, it really differs depending on the person. People have different opinions. What does sustainable uh, beekeeping mean? And it can mean different things to different people. Um, you know, for me, it's, I want my, my colonies to be sustainable. So I don't want to have to buy new bees every year because uh, that gets costly. Now, maybe some people have it, you know, they're independently wealthy because there's a, I met a beekeeper up here over, over the uh, state line in Wyoming, and he'd been a beekeeper for 10 years. And he said, oh, well, we have to buy bees every year because they can't survive in our climate, which is bullpucky I, you know i only lose about 10 percent, maybe 15 percent of my colonies every winter which I'm, I'm very proud of um and it took me a while to get to that you know back to that you know with with varroa coming in and, and we learned a lot of lessons over the years um but some people they they treat bees the sort of the way that we treat our our tomato and our pepper plants you know like pepper plants can be perennial in southern climates but up here we put a pepper plant in the spring and then it freezes and dies in the winter and we buy a new one in this and some people sadly are doing that with their bees and i think it's kind of sad you know kind of disrespectful for the bees to not learn how to keep them from dying but it's also pretty darn expensive and indeed if you're a normal person you know your spouse is going to start saying hey wait a second you know this is expensive and i don't know if you can continue this hobby if it, are if you it's... talking to my husband well i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so that's one one goal is to basically not not have your bees die every year 
Um, and then also raise your own replacements because you will. I mean, it, you're going to have some losses, hopefully le the low, lowest possible. So how to raise your own replacements so that you don't have to buy bees from someone else, you know, unless like you're getting in specific genetics of a queen or something. Um, and, and how to how to sustain bees in that way. Now, some folks ask me, well, is sustainable, you know, natural or treatment free? It depends. You know, I know a lot of tr treatment free beekeepers are losing 80% of their colonies every year. I wouldn't say that that's treatment free. But that said, I mean, there are, you know, integrated pest management techniques, there are you know, treatments for mites that are considered quote unquote organic. And so there are methods that you can use as part of that. Um, but it's, I, I try to look beyond, you know, what your philosophy of beekeeping is. It's more about, I can keep my bees alive. I can raise my own replacements, you know, not going to have ex excessive losses. Um, and then also not too many inputs too. You know, if you're having to feed your bees every year, you know, that gets expensive too. That's not very sustainable. So I'm going to cover kind of all of those topics and other people may have a, a different opinion. You know, if you're, if you want to do it as a business, you know, like a commercial beekeeper, you have to be able to pay your bills and pay your mortgage and, and all of that. So that's a different type of sustainability that they have to look at. So it's going to really depend on what kind of beekeeper you are. Um, you know, if you're a hobbyist and just want to have bees around, maybe honey production isn't that important, but you want to keep them alive. So you don't have to you know, buy new bees every year. That's, that's totally fine too. So a lot of it is going to depend on what you yourself, you know, the reasons why you yourself are a beekeeper. Right. Right. So for, you know, me, I love it because of the honey, but I've got some friends who they've got large gardens here in the Smoky Mountains and they want the pollination Yet others have completely different reasons. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's going to be part of that. Exactly. Perfect. Well, I, it really sounds like a really wonderful presentation. I'm um, sad that I have previous obligations. Also, as president, I typically would introduce you, um, but I'm probably going to just ask that you introduce yourself next Friday and Saturday um, so that Mike can um, be the man behind the camera and the projector and whatnot. Um, and so, and don't forget when you're on Zoom, just repeat the question. So everybody who's on Zoom, they're going to be like, you know, they need to hear that too. Um, and I like to have people get close to, we have this fancy new thing called an owl. So it's going to uh, have visual and then also audio, but you have to be near the owl and not walk around the room. Okay. Oh, that's um, hard. I'm, I'm very dynamic. I like to walk around and, and yeah. Well, just, like just remember that, you know, and then we usually have a Zoom czar in the room that says, hey, okay. you can't actually, we can't hear you. Blah, maybe blah, maybe blah. you need to put me on a leash, you know, so I can only go so far from, from it. You know, I'm like, kind I of think it'll be fine. So <laughs> why, so tell us about the doctor. So I don't, are you a doctor in bees or are you a doctor? I just want people to know a little well, bit. That would be so cool are. to be an entomologist, wouldn't it? Right. No, I'm, I'm a physician. I usually don't make a big deal of it because it's not really related to my um, expertise in beekeeping or my expertise in mead making. Um, you know, I was a beekeeper long before I, I went to medical school and became a physician. And I hope someday when I'm retired from medicine, I'm still going to be that old guy puttering out there as a beekeeper, you know, if, if my health holds out and all of that. Same. So, um, yeah, I'm an endocrinologist, which, you know, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's, I do. it's considered one of the most nerdy and intellectual specialties. Um, and it's been a wonderful, uh, you know, fit for me. Uh, it was kind of funny. A, a few years back, I went to learn how to do uh, instrumental insemination at Queen Bees. Oh, wow. And I was, yeah, I, was, I went to the ASU and, and um, you know, Dr. Osman was there and wonderful, wonderful guy. But we, they started talking about, you know, bee development and physiology and, and the hormones. And um, I started asking these really detailed questions and they're like, who are you? And what, oh, like, I'm an, ent I'm an endocrinologist. It rhymes with entomologist, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating that um, the hormones in insects, they're chemically very similar to mammals. Like, insects have insulin like growth factors that are about 80 percent similar to human insulin that is really cool i mean that's really rare for something to be so preserved in species that are so different or so we think um and they do kind of the same thing they, they don't have a pancreas or anything but it, it controls uh you know carbohydrate metabolism it's just really cool so um yeah anyway i, I could be a nerd in many different um oh i love it so, but well, I, know, and then that's I don't really why make a I think deal it's... about my medical. I mean, one time somebody was talking about bee sting allergy. I'm like, well, uh, you know, and they were arguing. I'm like, well, I am a physician. I'm not an allergy and melodist though. But I mean, I do know a little bit. So, but I usually don't ever even mention it. So, well, I want to mention it though, because I think it also adds a dimension to what you're talking about with genetic diversity, right? And when we talk about 
um, that you have a, a depth in the conversation that's available that not every speaker has um, to uh, have a available. I, I just have to say though, I've met many physicians who are also beekeepers and they really sucked at it. So luckily they were better. Physi being physicians or being beekeepers? Being beekeepers. <laughs> yeah, they were really good physicians, but they sucked at, bee at, be at keeping bees. So I, I don't think the two of them, I mean, <laughs> I can read a science article, you know, I, I have a background in clinical medical research. So that gives me an edge. If I'm reading a scientific article, I can look at it and, you know, is this a well-designed study and whatnot? That, that's um, something that I can do. But otherwise, you know, beekeeping is, it's such a craft. I mean, there's a lot it of is. science behind it, but there's a lot of art also. And it's not intuitive. I mean, I tell this to new beekeepers all the time. It is definitely not intuitive. Um, I love the kind of the the kind of like the journey, you know, the natural journey as a beekeeper of really um, being in lockstep with nature and also being at the effect of what nature's will is. I think it's very yeah. it's very humbling, right? In the in it the is. process, even of now, a even now, yeah. I, and you know, forty two years in, I still see things that I'm like I'm completely in awe or completely puzzled by. Um, and then there's the old thing where these are lessons that I've learned and I still make the same mistake because I'm, oh, they'll be fine until next week. And I come back next week and there's a bunch of bees up in the tree. Oh, well, they decided to swarm. You know, it just, well, I can't say I didn't know. I knew and I just ignored my, my knowledge. And that, that does happen too. <laughs> you know, but, my husband, when I, I'm a fifth year beekeeper, um, but um, the second generation, my uncles were big beekeepers. So I, I grew up around it. But I remember the first time I had a loss, you know, it feels like losing a dog and I'm sitting outside, you know, crying over my hives and my husband's like, you have got to get a grip. I'm like, you don't understand. This is like losing a dog. Just let me have my loss, you know? And, you know, it's uh, even when, like when I, Varroa came in before we figured it out, I, in the eighties, you know, if you, if you lost more than 20% of your bees per year, you were considered a bad beekeeper. And, you know, national average now is what 40 or 50% generally. Um, but there was one year, you know, where I lost 80% of my hives, you know, before we really knew about the treatments and things. And I mean, it wasn't one hive, this was like dozens of hives, you know, and I literally did sit down under a tree and cried my eyes out thinking that I, and I was already a beekeeper for what, 20 years? I mean, oh. I've been a beekeeper for a while. And I thought I was the most worthless, you know, beekeepers. And, but then you pick yourself up and you learn, you know, or you get give up. A lot of people were getting out of beekeeping at that point. Um, it was easy to find a lot of cheap, uh, you know, inexpensive equipment. And then a lot of uh, families that were commercial beekeepers, a lot of the, the, the kids didn't want to take over at that point because, you know, they didn't have almond pollination quite yet. You know, that really came in and saved the commercial beekeeping industry, you know, having a, a bit of, uh, you know, cash flow. Um, but yeah, it was really, these were bad times. It, it makes me sad that there's still people now that are losing bees to Varroa because they're not they're kind of ignoring the lessons of the past you know I and occasionally they come to our beekeeping meetings you know a club I don't go to club meetings that much but sometimes they come in and they tell us old-time beekeepers oh we know everything you know we watched YouTube we you guys are doing it all wrong and um you know when I was young I used to wonder why why are these older beekeepers so grumpy now I know I'm like I know why they're grumpy I keep my mouth, mouth you know shut and I'm like well you know hopefully you'll figure it out but <laughs> There's a lot okay, of I'll keep that in mind the next time I'm face to face with a grumpy old beekeeper. Yeah, There's I used to wonder that. You know, and I was probably the annoying 13 or 14 year old, you know, asking a, a hundred questions, you know, but they were very patient and tolerant. Thank goodness. This is um, so great. And so, yeah. and then Tom, how can people reach you? Uh, if they're seeing this on YouTube, the event has long passed and it's years into the future. And they're like, gosh, I really, I want me a piece of Tom. How do they get you? Yeah. Well, I, I am on Facebook. Um, you know, it's nice to know that you're a real person and not some random person trying to friend me. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, actually two YouTube, YouTube channels. I have Canyon Rim Honeybees, um, where some of these presentations are, and I'll put future presentations. And then I also have a mead making channel that I'm slowly adding to. It's uh, called, uh, what is my mead making channel? It's called Art and Science of Mead. So, so let's just do, uh, so let's just make sure so uh, that these are the right channels right here. Um, so we've got Canyon Rim Honeybees, that's it? Yeah, uh, that's uh, the blog. It's going to be the YouTube, the second one below. Okay, then the, yeah, this the is one. the YouTube, okay? Yep, yep. And then here's the Facebook page. Yeah, right? and I'm not and then, too active on the Facebook page, but yeah, if you want to contact me even privately, that's fine too. Okay, great. And so the, but if you all want some uh, resources in the meantime, then there's also some uh, videos with you here that I see. And then mm -hmm. also your art and science of mead. Correct. Um, awesome. Well, we are so excited. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. 
And I know Mike has wanted me to come you. down for a while and I'm just, I'm really grateful to be able to come down and, and it's not just a quick trip either, which is the best. You know, the worst thing is I, I do a lot of speaking around the U.S. and you're there and then you do your speech, you know, and then you, you're flying out that afternoon. You hardly had, had time to hang out with anybody. So. Yeah, well, we, I know Mike is super excited to host you and, um, you know, and we're in beautiful Hendersonville, North Carolina you know, the Smoky Mountains. And so you're gonna be able to see a little bit. I've been of... down there, but not for many years. So it's going to be really oh, nice. Great. To, oh, to, good. Um, yeah, I've been down in that area, but not again, not for many years, but it'll be nice to be back. And so, yeah. Thank you, sir.